Good morning. Wow, so happy to see you here. Woo, I feel a little loud in the mic. Hello. Sounds loud to you probably too. All right, everybody pop their ears. I haven't popped my ears like 12 times already this today. It's like they keep filling up from the altitude. But what an exciting place to be. So excited that you're here. Thank you so much for coming ready to worship God, coming with such a spirit of joy and rejoicing. And this is a time of rejoicing. In fact, God said when you come to celebrate the feast, he said, you shall rejoice. He actually commanded and he said, you're going to rejoice because I'm going to bless you. And he wants to bless us. He wants us to rejoice. He wants us to know that he's engaged in our life. And this whole celebration is an invitation to come to have eight days basically outside of our normal routines, outside of our jobs, to spend our time focused on him. And the more we focus on him, the more we receive of his love, the more we receive of his joy, and we're just transformed by it. We cannot help but be changed by spending time with God. And God loves us. God rejoices over us. Uh, As the scripture said, it even says he sings over us. And when you think of who our father is and the kind of passion that he comes with to offer us life, he wants that same passion from us. That's why the first great commandment is to love him with all your heart, your soul, your might. He wants our lives. He wants us to be dedicated to him. So I want to go ahead and thank uh, Rebecca and... uh, (laughs) <laughs> oh, wow, Stephen, for singing up here today and just leading that beautiful special music song and then all the worship, Izzy, Bronte, Rebecca, the whole team, because you allowed us to rejoice before God. So yeah, go ahead, Juan. Thank you so much. We want to be able to come and rejoice before the Lord. Now, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of Leviticus uh, chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. Of course, these are very familiar verses to us if we've spent any time celebrating the feast. Leviticus 23, and notice with me in verse 43. So these verses, let's uh, read actually verses 42 to 43. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. And that is our theme for this feast that you shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh, your God. So these verses in Leviticus 23, he's saying, I want you to come rejoice. I want you to come celebrate. You're bringing in the harvest. Everything's happy. And then I want you to dwell in booths because I want you to remember that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of slavery when he brought him out of Egypt. Why why do you think he combined this with rejoicing? What What do you think about this whole time? What did it look like when they left Egypt and went into the wilderness? How would you describe that time when you think about that journeying, that time in the wilderness? What are some of the things that you think of that the Bible tells us about that time? And this is for participation if anybody wants it. All right, Todd, I know you have something to say. A logistical nightmare, nightmare, right? You know what? I get here, I'm like, I'm so happy there's running water. And there's a toilet right off the bedroom. It's like, that's so nice. And a bed to sleep in with sheets. And I'm thinking a lot of nice things, right? But think about picking up, taking everything you have, going through with all the people. It's a nightmare, right? What about just the people there? Was God really happy with the way they were walking through the desert, this time dwelling in booths? When he says, I want you to remember this, was that a good time? It's, what does it say? You guys are really shy this morning, so, you know, maybe it's the crowd's too big, but he says, hey, he was not well pleased. They spent 40 years in a wilderness going around in booths and 1 Corinthians tells us that with most of them, God was not pleased. So why would that be a time of celebration? What did they do? They committed idolatry. They made the golden calf, right? They bowed down to it. They rose up. They played. They worshiped it. They committed sexual immorality, right? 20,000 plus died in a single day, right? They complained. They murmured. They were unhappy. They wanted Moses out. They took sides against God's appointed. They didn't like the way things were going in general. But God says, this is a time I want you to remember this journeying 
in this wilderness. And the fact of the matter is, we are on a journey as well that God has with us, that he wants us to be remembering this time of dwelling in tents. And I want you to turn with me over to the book of Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. Because here are the people that God had called out specifically. Here are people that were brought together and God has them in the wilderness. He says, I want you to celebrate this feast, remembering this time, because I made them to do this. And you'll recall when, when God appeared to Moses, what was, what was the offer? He said, I've heard the cries of my people, right? In Exodus 3, he said, I've heard them. I'm going to bring them up out of the land of Egypt into a good and large land, a land flowing with milk and honey. No mention there of the wilderness. The promise of a good and large land full, flowing with milk and honey was there for everybody, but he made them dwell in the wilderness in these booths. Now notice what it says here in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 11. It said, you divided the sea before them, so they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and their persecutors you threw into the deep as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, you led them by day with a cloudy pillar and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the road which they should travel. You came down also on Mount Sinai, spoke with them from heaven, gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger. You brought them water out of the rock for their thirst. You told them to go in to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers acted proudly hardened their necks and did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey. They were not mindful of your wonders that, they, that you did among them, but they hardened their necks. And in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God. Now, I want you to see something about this because a lot of verses in the scriptures talk about what they did that was not good. But I want you to notice what was good during this time of dwelling. I want you to see the point that it says, but you are God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and you did not forsake them. See, Sometimes we can look at the Israelites, we can say, you know, this was a time of, of, of not very good living. God wasn't pleased with what they were doing. There was a lot of sinning going on. But where was he in it? Where was he around them in it? Did he just say, that's it, I'm done with you people, I'm, I'm away. And, and it says that he was ready all the time and did not forsake them. Notice verse 18. And even when they made a molded calf for themselves and said, this is your God that brought you up out of Egypt and worked great provocations, yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. He was still God. He still was full of manifold mercies all the love that is from God that he wants us to see in the story when we think about that he made them to dwell in booths. Now, he says back in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 to 3, in Deuteronomy 8, 2 to 3, he says, you will remember that the Lord your God led you all these way, these 40 years in the wilderness, to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So God's heart, was that he loved his people. He was not going to give up on them. And my friends, he is not going to give up on us. See, the celebration of a harvest coming in 
becomes a reality because God will not give up on us. And we know that all this life is temporary. We know all this life is but a shadow of time. But God is saying, look at what I did. I would not give up. I would provide for them. I wanted to see something, and he wants to see from us. He says, to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you. He allowed you to hunger. He fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you to know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So instead of sexual immorality, he wanted fidelity. That's what God's about, fidelity, faithful, being true, right? When they were hungry, what did he want? He wanted them to look to him, to receive the blessing from him, to be thankful. Remember, Jesus goes into the wilderness, 5,000 people, two fish, five loaves. What's he do? He says, thank you, Father. He wasn't looking at the two fish and the five loaves. He was looking at the Father. Now, here's the thing about this pillar of cloud and this pillar of fire. It says in the book of uh, Numbers chapter 9 that God put it upon the tabernacle that he had caused them to make in the wilderness. That the pillar would rest on the tabernacle. He was dwelling with the people at the tabernacle. And it said when the, when the cloud lifted, whether it was day or night, and started to move, then the command came forth from Moses, according to the charge of the Lord, they would move. They watched him go, they went. He settled on the tabernacle, they tabernacled. But God wanted to tabernacle with his people. And when we look at this time in the tabernacling in the wilderness, we're seeing that God was saying, I am with you. I am here for you. I'm not forsaking you. And I'm going to be right here to show you the way. Now, I want you to think about the reality as we look back at the Israelites, because this lesson is for us that we would learn that as God was moving about, as God was lifting the pillar and, and, and sending it in different directions, and it said whether it was two days that it rested, whether it was a month, whether it was a whole year that it sat on the tabernacle, God wanted to be with his people and he wanted his people to be with him. Do you ever embrace the reality of that, that God wants you to be with him? The whole reason for your existence is that God wants you to be with him. And we look at this time with the Israelites and say, why couldn't you? You know, you ever watch like a show on TV and all of a sudden like, don't do it. Don't go through that door, right? Stop. You know, sometimes you read the Bible, you're like, why did you guys do that? Eve, don't do it, right? Adam, don't eat that fruit. And you root, right? You're rooting, saying, oh, don't, don't do that. I need you to be a rooter in your own life and a rooter in the lives of all the people in here and the people that you know to root for God's way. Because, see, we can look back. When we look back, it's easy. Going through it day by day, 40 years in the wilderness, that's got to be tough. We look back and say, we, well, we're looking at their whole lives compressed. Why couldn't they just obey God? Didn't they see the pillar of cloud? Didn't they see the pillar of fire by night? Didn't they see the manna falling from heaven every day, twice as much on the six, so they could remember the Sabbath and keep it? Didn't they see the water come out of the rock? Didn't they see who split the Red Sea? Didn't they see who destroyed the enemy? Didn't they see he was always there? And I think the answer is no. They got used to his presence to the point they could no longer see and it was no longer impacting their lives so much so that they acted in ways that showed they didn't see God was right there. They were going on the journey, but they were going through motions because what was happening in their heart was not the transformation that God wanted all those miracles, all those signs, all those wonders were right in front of their eyes and they didn't see. He was right there. And you know, the reality is sometimes in our hearts we say, oh, if I saw God like that, I would be like perfectly obedient. If I really knew that the cloud was with me by day, the pillar of fire by night, if I had sight, I would do, I would obey. 
And I would say that God is saying, no, you need to look at this lesson because without faith, it's impossible to please me. And without faith, you won't follow me. And just because you know I exist, you've gotten to the point where the demons also believe and tremble, but you're not really changing your life for me. See, God is wanting us to understand that what he wants is an intimate relationship with us, a fellowship where we know him as he knows us. You know, that's a promise in 1 Corinthians 15 that we now see in part, we know in part, but it says in that day, we will know as we are known. We will know the number of hairs on his head. We will know the thoughts in his heart. We will be in communion with the Lord. There won't be the barriers. But see, we get used to the miracles. And in this whole world we live, we're used to the miracles. You, you go out and look at those trees. Wow, God, that's awesome. All these colors, all these things, all the magnificence of your creation. He speaks to us over and over. We get so used to just saying, yeah, you put seeds in the ground and different stuff comes up. Well, how does that happen? I mean, that seed was like this big and all of a sudden there's this plant and then it produces fruits. And if you cut one of those fruits open, there's a bunch of those little seeds. Like that's the best trick ever, right? Like in, in terms of like what we think magic tricks, I'm, God, he shows off in brilliant ways to us all the time. And we're like, I don't know if there is a God. I think we should look around us. We should see the grace of God, the manifold uh, mysteries of his, his, his mercy, his wisdom, his love, his justice. He has all of this for us. And he's calling out to come celebrate this feast with me. Come remember the lesson of the wilderness and let's root for the right things. Let's root for the right things. So we've been talking here about what happened to the Israelites in the wilderness and what does that really mean to us now? There's a, there's a reality we need to catch on to and it was caught on by all those of faith. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Because this is something we have to understand and in, in, in God in this chapter, he's telling us about all those who were faithful. He's basically giving us the hall of faith, listing out men and women who were faithful to him. And in this, he says this in Hebrews chapter 11. Notice with me here in verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Now, we know that after 40 years, they entered the promised land. We also know that those who were above the age of 20 did not. We know there was a time of sojourning. We know there was a time of great death in the wilderness. And you know, can you kind of even imagine, you know, they estimate maybe there was a couple million people. I, I'm not sure, I, I won't even go there. I know it was a lot of people. But 40 years, 360 days in a year, wow, how much death did you see in 40 years? See, these things can make you wonder too, right? We have loved ones die. We have broken relationship. We go through divorces. We go through different experiences in our life where we're friends for a while and then we're not friends for a while. People pass in and out of our lives all the time. We have these things. What's it all mean, God? What does it all mean? We're just all ending up somewhere else. And the thing is, we're to know we end up somewhere else that there was always a plan for somewhere else, that when they were in the wilderness, what God was saying is, you're in here now, I'm making you be, I wanna see what's in your heart, but really, what I want you to see is that there is a promised land to go to. And, and so he says here in Hebrews 11, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but they saw them afar off, they were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly, they seek a homeland. Who of you on this earth say, I don't belong here? Who says I'm a stranger and a pilgrim? Who says this is just a time? Because see, when you look at the Israelites in the wilderness, what did they do? They, they're like, this isn't great. This isn't great. And it's not really what, what they were hoping for. Look, God, they weren't in a promised land. They weren't in a land flowing with milk and honey. They weren't in safety under fig trees and grapevines. They didn't have plenty of water. There wasn't a lot of food. They weren't in a permanent home. As Todd said, it's a logistical nightmare. 
because nothing is set up the way you want it to be. They were constantly on a move in a sandy desert where average temps in the summer were over 100 degrees. It was hot. It was nasty. It was not nice. It wasn't pleasant. Why did God do that? He said, I wanted to humble them to see what was in their hearts. Two great ways to find out what's in hearts. Give them affliction, give them wealth. They both reveal what's going on inside. And God knows. When you get a little power, you get a little money, it shows what's going on in you. You, you go through hard times, you go through things where you're desperate for survival, shows what's going on in you. And the thing is, we can look at all the things that we don't have. We can put our focus and attention on what's going around us in the wilderness. But all the time, God has been saying, look for the pillar. Look for where I am. I'm here to dwell at the tabernacle. I'm here to lead you and guide you. Do you think that because you don't see the pillar today, the cloud by day, the fire by night, that God is not present with you? Do you think that he's not around you because he's not doing a manifest presence. He's showing you that whether he manifests himself or not is irrelevant because what he's really trying to get is a manifestation of faith in you and me to believe that as we walk through these, this temporary life, that he's our everything. He's our inheritance. He's our abundance and prosperity. He's where we go to dwell in safety with everything that we need. He is our food. He is our drink, and he is our permanent place. For we proclaim here at this feast, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with us, and we will be his people, and he will be our God. That is the vision that God has set forth to tabernacle with you and me. And all this tabernacling in life that we are doing here today is but a time in order to see what we will do with it. You have been given the riches of time. Scott was talking in the offertory. What is basically the way we show it? God gives us resources, God gives us time. What are you gonna do with it? Every one of our lives really comes down to that decision. When Jesus said, seek you first, the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all the things you worry about in life are gonna be added to you, he says, and don't worry about tomorrow. The worries of tomorrow, they're gonna be sufficient for themselves. He said, what are you doing today? See, you can't control tomorrow. You can take steps toward a better future today, right? Some of small steps going forward can lead you to better things. But all you can really address is today. You can't change your past. You can't change your future. All you can affect is now. Faith is a present thing. The just live by faith. God is looking for a people who believe in him. Not just have faith, but believe in him. In Deuteronomy, it says that when he was talking about rejoicing, he said, every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God. He said, you will surely come and rejoice. Why? Because I'm gonna bless you in all your produce and I'm gonna bless you in all your work. What are you working on? See, this is an amazing thing to contemplate in life because what if you're working on the wrong things? What if you're working on something that's not really what God has said to work on? So this is the work of God that you would believe in God and in the Son whom he sent. That's what Jesus said. That there would be a work of faith going on in your life and in my life. Turn over to Psalm 90. Psalm 90 Psalm chapter 90, and notice what it says here in Psalm 90 and verse 10. The days of our lives are 70 years. So Scott was quoting this as well. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. What are you going to boast about in those 70, 80 years or however many years of life that you have? You see, this life... Without God is nothing but vanity. That's what it is. You can spend a lot of your life 
trying to go to every sporting event, trying to be the best at work, trying to make a name for yourself and have a reputation. If God is not in your fun or your work, if God is not in your relationships, what does it really mean? It goes away so fast and what you think you might accomplish, it's all fleeting. It's amazing how much attention we can put on stuff that simply doesn't matter, but yet we're kind of this way. There's so much vanity and, 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 and what's it gonna be? You know, our lives can look so similar to people that are, whether they're, they know God or not. I mean, most people wake up in the morning. How many of you guys do that? It's always a good start to the day. Waking up in the morning, very good start. Now, maybe you start with prayer in the morning, but most people at some point will maybe exercise, maybe take a shower, let's hope so, guys. Get your hair done, right? Get ready for the day, eat some breakfast, maybe go to work. You're being active in all these things. Life kind of looks vain. Whether you know God or not is kind of the same stuff. But it's in all this vanity of life in all this dwelling in tents, in all these logistical nightmares, I'm going to keep using that, Todd, since you helped me out. It's, it's through all of this vanity, God is working out an eternal weight of glory in your life as you believe. See, there's a labor that's being done. Remember at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, he says, thanks be to God who has given us the victory through his son, Jesus Christ, in verse 57. In verses 58, he says, therefore... Do the work, immovable, steadfast, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's not in vain. It looks vain to you. It says, what does all this mean? And God's like, don't you see? I'm shaping through all of these intricacies of relationships, all of the troubles, all the trials, all the things that come and go. I'm shaping you. But, I, but he's asking for this thing, belief. Christ has done this work in our lives, but it happens by belief. So continuing on here, he says in Psalm 90, he says, so in verse 11, who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Number your days. He's really saying, life's short. Do you think about life as short? Do you think about the days? It says, verse 13, return, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. O satisfy us early with your mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Friends, if you don't feel a joy in the Lord coming here to worship God, I'm asking you, turn your attention on him. It is literally impossible when you come to God's feasts and focus on the promises and the, the things that he is saying to us to not be happy. It's super hard. What makes us unhappy is we say, I don't have enough food. Where's the water, God? Why am I still in this desert? Why is this so hard? Why are there all these afflictions? Because we're looking at the wrong stuff. The time in the wilderness wasn't meant to knock people off their course. It was meant to humble people so we would look at him. And your life is no different. God is wanting to tabernacle in your life. God is wanting to be with you. God is wanting to satisfy you early with mercy that we may have joy, rejoicing, and being glad. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us. As you, as you made it hard, make it happy. Come, God, do your work. Blessings. In the years in which we have seen, notice this, let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. We become like the Israelites physically in the wilderness when we fail to see what God has been doing every day. We just, we don't see. So the pillar becomes common. That fire at night, it's common. That bread coming down from heaven, it, yeah, it happens every day. Nothing special about it. And we make God common in our mind because we're looking at circumstances, we're looking at where we are, and we're not looking to where we're going. We have to remember the faithful declare, I'm a pilgrim and a stranger here. This is not where it ends up. This is not what I'm hoping to have is the end of my life. And God is saying, I want you to see that. I want you to know that in your life. So he says, 
this beautiful thing. He says, let the, your work, verse 16 again, appear to your servants. Can you just pray that prayer in your heart right now to the Lord? Father, in Jesus' name, let me see your work. Let me see what you're doing. Let me see what you want. Let me see when you lift the cloud. Let me follow in your presence. Let me just enjoy being with you. Whether you stay here for two days, a month, or a year, let me be with you and be with me. Be my God. And he says, verse 17, and let the beauty of Yahweh our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us and establish, yes, establish the work of our hands. Be immovable, steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing it's not in vain. To see life in him. Turn with me over to Psalm 39 and notice with me in Psalm chapter 39. Psalm chapter 39 and verse 4. Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. There's this weird thing where we, we, we just don't grab on to the frailty that really is this life and what the hope is that is everlasting ahead. We so much want to have it here and now and, and we can spend our attention or put our attention and spend our time on things that are not faith building. But see, all this vanity, it's all the opportunity to see Will we bring God into everything, right? We talked about the tabernacle of God, the vision of God, that the tabernacle of God would be with men, that he would dwell with us, he would be our God, we would be his people. The other prophecy and vision is that God would be all in all. Or as it could be rendered, everything in everything. That's a good question to ask. Is today God everything in everything? Because when God's everything in everything, it takes the vanity and bring substance. Because what we realize is that God is doing a work in us that though it might look hard, that though we might be suffering in many ways, those things aren't to be belittled. Those things are to be understood that yes, we will have affliction. Yes, we will go through times of humbling. Yes, we will have these experiences. And God brought believers together so there would be those who are strong at moments when you're weak. In moments you would be strong when others are weak that we would rely on each other, that we would encourage each other, that we would be about building faith and edifying up. So much of what God is looking for in faith is to understand it's not just about the knowledge of the word, it's the faith that is derived from it. That you can see God in a pillar, but it doesn't mean you believe. You have to trust and know whatever you have, God, is good for me. And that heart of love, that heart of faith, it's a trusting heart that will dictate behavior because we want to be in his will and we want to be moving where he goes. But it is so much more than knowledge because knowledge can puff up, but love is what it edifies. Love is what brings together. And God said, faith, hope, and love, these things abide forever. As you go into God's word, as you're working on your faith, because that is one of the things he says, is that faith is that work. Here's the work of God that you would believe. As you're working on belief, as you're thinking about how you relate to God, are you seeing a transformation where God is now becoming everything and everything? You know, we're going to get together here and we're going to have some time of just celebration and fun. Is God welcome? Is God welcome when you're drinking High West uh, bourbon or uh, Alpine gin? I like both, okay? Confession time. I'm David, I like bourbon and gin. But God's gotta be in that drinking or otherwise it becomes something not of God. The enjoyment of life, God gives, he says in Ecclesiastes, it's a gift to enjoy it. But if you enjoy it separate from God, it's like, well, I had my God time and now I'm gonna have my enjoyment time. You're probably not yet seeing that God wants to be there dwelling too. And this is where we humanly compartmentalize God in our lives, where we basically say, not with my whole heart, all my soul, all my might, because God, I have my time with you and then I get my own time. But see, if God can't be in your fun, I'm not sure that's the best use of the fun. 
Why can't God be included if you're playing with your kids? Why can't God be in the kickball game? God in a kickball game is a good thing. You can quote me on that. God in a kickball game is a good thing. Having God involved in our lives in the day-to-day is what he wants. He's saying, let me in. Let me be a part of your life. I want to be everything and everything. And so it changes the way then you play kickball. You have more joy, more patience, more consideration. You're looking to do things in a way God would do it because he's welcome in your life and he's leading you in the way to go. So he says, teach me to number my days. Consider life. Verse 39 again, that I may know. Verse five, indeed, you made my days as hand breaths. My age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is butt vapor. Did I read that wrong? All right, all right. We say whatever happens in school and ministry stays in school and ministry. You know, you think that guys are all mature, but then they read a verse like this, and they're like, yeah, you at your best state are butt vapor. It's like, okay, guys, ha, ha, ha. Everybody in school and ministry is nothing but a 12-year-old having fun with it, but, I mean, look at it. It's what it says, Taking the Bible literally is what we want to do at Rock Valley. And so we, we look at these verses. But seriously, you're, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll delete the word. Every man at his best state is just vapor. <laughs> or butt vapor. But however you want to teach it to your kids, that's fine by me. The, the thing is, that's about what you are. You're just... It's just a whisper. Do, you, do we see that we're frail? Do we see where we're headed? Do we actually think about this could be it? We don't know the last day of our lives. I don't know. This could be it for me. Today could be it. So I better be thinking today about what my last day needs to look like. And, and this feast is a reminder to be putting our lives on this. Now, teach us to number our days is something that I've kind of understood, it's like, hey, your days are short, but how do you, how do you really do that? And I got a visual uh, this uh, summer. I took my boys to a dude ranch, and we went on a tour of a beehive. So that the handsome guy in the middle is me, and, and those are my two boys. You can't see us, and this is the best view of me. It's better when I'm in a suit like this, you know, to, to, to be visible. But there it is. I took a tray out of a beehive. I'm holding the bees and the honey. But we got to learn about bees. And here's something that I had no idea about. The political and governmental structure of a beehive is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I had no clue. I mean, the things that go on between kings of England and succession plans and how it all works, bees are like way more sophisticated. They are complex. And God made them this way. God made them this way. So here's the thing about bees. I didn't know this, but I always used to think, well, like the males are the protectors, right? They're the ones that sting you. Yeah, people shaking their head no. No, males pretty much, they're there for mating with a queen, and that's about it. And I'm not kidding. They kind of don't do much. In fact, they're called drones. And it's like, you know, I know some ladies in here are like, yeah, guys are kind of drones. But there's like, what purpose do they really have? It's to mate with the queen if they're lucky. And if they get to mate with the queen, as soon as they're done, they blow up. And that's the end of their life. So that's, that's it, guys in a nutshell. But, but here, I want you to look at the life of bees. They number their days. A bee comes to life and immediately it starts cleaning. It cleans out the cells and starts keeping the brood warm, they immediately know what to do. Like the days one and two are numbered. Now when, when days one and two happen, it moves into days three and five, three, four, five, they start feeding the older larvae. They, they, this, they transition from their first job to their next job. They now are taking on a different responsibility within the hive. Days six to 11, they start feeding the younger larvae. Right? I don't know if it's like get practice with the older ones. They could live without food. The young need more. I don't know how God designed it this way, but this is what they've documented happens. They feed the younger larvae, days 6 to 11, days 12 to 17. Now they go into construction. 
You've made it past this nurturing stage to a point where in days 12 to 17, you construct the honeycombs and you start transporting food within the heart within the hive. You, you're, you're in transportation and construction and you're making the wax that goes on for all of this work that's done. And then days 18 to 21, now they become the centurions. They're the guards of the hive. They've gotten mature enough to that point where they're ready to sting people that want to mess with you, right? It's like mama bear, but it's mama bee. Mama bee doesn't like people messing with the hive. And so all these females are going through all of this work and they come to day 21, 18 to 21, they guard the hive. And then days 22 to 35, it's like they're hitting the pinnacle of maturity. And what does God send them out to do? They're going to leave the hive. They're going to go pollinate flowers. They're going to collect the pollen. They're going to grab that uh, nectar and the propolis. I don't know how you say that. And the water. But they have like even these cool little sacks on the back of their legs. Like God made them with sacks to like carry this stuff, right? And it's like, this is awesome. Like in the pinnacle of life is to go make it so all this fruit can happen, right? So they go to the avocado trees, right? They go to your tomato plants. They go to your blueberries. And then you get this awesome blueberry honey and this avocado honey and all this different kinds of honey like they put together and God had all these different flavors coming out of all these plants and all the nectar. And, and we get to enjoy this amazing thing that goes on that God made this beautiful product that never spoils, right? Honey is, is good. It's, it's, it's like an antiseptic. It, it basically can be put on your wounds to help heal. It does all these amazing things. And yet it was all happening because of these little bees. And God designed this whole thing. And what's so amazing is that because bees have numbered days, they kind of know where they fit into the days, what the role is, what the job is. You see, when you're a kid growing up, you're basically just learning stuff, right? You got to learn your ABCs. You got to learn how to talk and how to communicate, to say please and thank you. You've got to learn, you know, how to read and, and have good communication. You've got to learn stuff, right? So you can be more valuable in what you're going to do in your life. And you grow up and you learn, you challenge, you pressure, you strive for independence. You're trying to see who am I, why am I? And you go through all these motions. You maybe become parents, you get married. You learn a whole bunch of stuff in marriage about how marriage works and how relationships work. And it changes you. You have children, you have different things that go on. And kids teach us so much. And even whether you have them or not, we learn so much about children and the impact that they have on our lives. And then as they grow up, you, you have this other phase. You know, I, I'm in my fifth decade now. I'm realizing it is just like this transformation from age to age. I'm kind of like a bee. I play different roles, right? You know, I'm the, I'm the snot-nosed kid on days, you know, one to two. And, you know, I'm, I'm a little cuter days three to five. All these things kind of change through life and you go through these different roles. But what's kind of cool is bees... Because the way God made them, they kind of just accept what their role is. We fight our roles. See, we were made to have an identity in Jesus Christ, and anything outside of that identity is misdirected. See, the, the life that God chose for us was to be one found in him, and we find our salvation, we find our life, we find the way we see the cloud if you're not seeing the cloud of God in your life, if you're not seeing his direction, why not expect more from your creator? Because he offered this to us to find him. But here's what happens. You don't go straight from Egypt to the promised land. There is a time of humbling. There is a time of journey. There is a time of saying, I need to be broken before the Lord to realize he is God and I am not. And I am not permanent, and my life is frail, and God, teach me wisdom. Teach me to number my days, because I don't know what is left. All I know is what I have, and today is a day of learning. It's a day of expectation. So this is the opportunity day. What is it that will make it different for you? You've come to this feast. You have time off. You're here. You're not at work today. What are you going to do with it? 
I want you to see this feast as a jewel of time and to think about what it is that God would want you and God, me and God to do for these eight days. Because if we don't begin with that question, everything else might just look like vain time. But if we bring God into everything, now we can have permanent time. Now we find our true inheritance. Now we find the real food. We find what satisfies us. And this is what God wanted us to see is that he had this time of opportunity. Now it was so cool for me personally in preparing this message and just meditating on the work of God, the faith of God, going through these cycles, thinking about our lives, understanding a little bit more about why he would want us to focus on dwelling in booths, why he would say, you're going to do this. I want every generation to remember I made them do this because he wants us to know he made us do it too, that this life is made for this time with God and it's just a whisper, it's just a vapor, it's just a small time on this journey toward the real thing that we're alive for. Don't get so stuck in the vision of what's happening in the world around you that you miss what God has been doing all the time. We can look at the political reports, we can look at the news, we can see our governments, we can look at taxation, we can find so much to complain and whine about, and God's like, do you even see the pillar anymore? Are you even taking notice that I'm right here? Because God's command, his will, it says... Rejoice in the Lord always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Have you thought about that at this feast, that what is the will that God wants is that I would be focused on doing that? If you do that, you realize you're right in his will. If you are here and you say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to rejoice in Christ Jesus, we're going to pray without ceasing, and in everything we're going to give thanks. In everything. In everything. You are right in his will. He said, do all things without complaining and murmuring. Don't look at anything but me, and I will take care of your needs. God won't let you down. He won't leave you or forsake you. But in this opportunity, what was cool was that I got here, and Liz Glasgow, if you don't know Liz, make sure to meet her. She's one of the, the six people that uh, God called to start Oak Stone in Dallas, Texas, and Liz is just a wonderful person. She's very thoughtful. She's very converted I, and just a, just a wonderful person to know. So make sure you meet Liz. She's probably out taking care of her kids because that is her uh, numbered days right now. But she wrote something that I want to share with you because she didn't know what I was speaking on and I didn't know what she was thinking. But she gave this to me and she's never done this before, but she gave it to me uh, when we got here and, and uh, as we were talking about her meditation. She wrote this. We are all temporary dwellings of the Holy Spirit. The feast lasts for seven days with an eighth day, holy convocation. I'm reminded that we are all given 70 years, and if by reason of strength 80, the feast is somewhat like the journey, uh, excuse me, somewhat like the journey of life. I always have this feeling at the feast. The first three days seem to go at a normal or even somewhat slow pace. And then day four hits. And we are at that middle point of the feast, and the next few days fly by as if they were just one. And I feel that way about life. As I near 40, I'm approaching that middle marker of life. When I was a child, time seemed to stand still. Even in college, I thought four years was an eternity. Now four years is a blink. Now a decade seems like not that much time. And I recognized that the relativity of time will continue to increase as I continue, God willing, toward that eighth decade. I think this is by design. We must learn to number our days, to rejoice in the Lord, and prioritize what is the most important part of our lives. We don't have time to focus on the trifles and the stuff that fades. Our children need our attention and patience. Our character needs our discipline. Our relationship with our creator needs our focus and our care. We just don't have time to waste Rejoice this Feast of Tabernacles with a full heart and with great praise. Make the effort to connect with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Get involved. Focus on people and not on things. Don't treat it like a vacation. Don't waste this Feast of Tabernacles. That's beautiful. It is everything that I was thinking too. And obviously it was on Scott's mind when he was talking this morning. This is the theme of this feast. 
And it is a theme of the feast that should be a theme of our lives. Don't waste this life. Life is so precious. But you're not really living your best life if God's not in it. A lot of things we can do, a lot of ways we can satisfy ourselves. But if God is not at the center of it, what does it mean? So I want you to think about these things for this feast and this life. Great thing to do each day. Pursue higher things before God and man. Put God first. Pray without ceasing. Be about his business, that is believe and encourage belief in other people. Live faithfully and encourage fidelity within the body, the church. Rejoice and be thankful in everything. I hope that these lessons mean something to you. I hope that you would take this now and and use it. Think about it, meditate on it. Make this feast a great feast. Make this time that you have away with God a great time and realize he's given you this life. It's very quick, but it's one that comes with great eternal reward that he's working out in each one of us. Let's give him praise and thanks.